Hi everyone, my name is Morgan Tang. I'm so excited to be here today to talk about complex design and how to balance simplicity and complexity in our daily job as designers. And first, I'd like to ask everyone to think about how do we pitch a job as designers? How do we pitch a job when we, as a community, don't always agree on the definition of designs or even our old titles? Often, we have a result to saying things like, oh, I make things easier, I make things simpler, I make things more fluid. And I've used these shortcuts a lot, especially when I started the design team eight years ago in the Corporate Investment Banking Division of Societe Generale, a French financial group. I was trying to justify our roles on project to people who sometimes have never worked with designers before. But really, is a mission to simplify everything. And from whose point of view? Often, we apply our own mental models to judge what's best for others, even when we know that we are not our users. It's a bit like if I was going around on the trading floors and seeing the screens of my sales and traders, I'd be like, oh my god, that's too complicated. Um, there's so many buttons, so many numbers, let me replace everything with a single click button. And you press it, voila. But there's a serious risk of oversimplifying our designs. And sometimes we may be creating black boxes. Especially, I'm thinking of complex industries, finance, healthcare, business to business, services, or sometimes tools for employees. And I know my doodle is a bit extreme here, but in real life, we may be saying things like, oh, I was too cluttered, or icons are more aesthetic, or it wasn't looking nice, so I removed all this. This thinking, I think, is especially prevalent on social media. You know all the before UX, after UX, top UX UI tips, and it gets, basically, everything gets simplified without context. And I can see this creeps into our hiring interviews where some candidates just assume that we designers should simplify everything, make everything look like a food delivery app. And I realized today how little exposure some designers and some design students have to what good design means for complex uh, screens for expert and advanced users. So this is the genesis of my talk. It started as a story we tell to the new joiners in the team then turn into a Medium article, then into a talk, and I'm so pleased to be sharing this at Config today. We are going to go through these three topics. So first, we'll get familiar with what designing for advanced users look like with real-life comparisons. Then, I'll share a concept to help you find the right balance between simplicity and complexity in a project. And finally, if you're exploring the complex design space or are tempted by it, how to survive and thrive. Let's start with comparisons. In our everyday life, we use apps as consumers. We listen to music, we watch videos online, we order food online. But have you ever thought about what's behind the scenes for the professionals and the interfaces they use? You actually don't get to see those screens very often unless you're part of this very intimate circle. So this is the reason why I gathered a couple of examples for you. We'll start easy. I think you all know this search engine. But what's on the other side for the professionals? The upside down side of things? It's this, Google Ads. As you can see here, the layout is more compact, the fonts are smaller, and it's basically just a bunch of boring gray tables. But this actually represents Google's main source of revenue. Let's move to healthcare. This is what you can see on Apple's health app. And again, what, are, what could be used by the professionals? Maybe something like this. Again, there's a lot of things going on, lots of acronyms. I'd, I don't really get what's happening here. Final example. We can also have different levels of complexity within B2B products. So this screen is an example from my company, Societe General. It's an interface we give to small and medium enterprises in France to manage their foreign exchange needs. As you can see, everything is kept simple. 
users are supported step by step in the process. But again, would that be used by, I don't know, treasurers from very big international companies or even all internal sales and traders? No. And it's not necessarily what you can uh, uh, see in movies. Usually, they would use something more like this. As you can see, it's a lot more compact, a lot of things going on here, because those users, they have to follow multiple currencies at the same time, and they can trade very advanced financial instruments sometimes. So here, our promise is a bit different. We want to allow them to work efficiently and stay in the flow, kind of be professionals. So when we, designers, and people from the outside world, when we see those interfaces, they are complex, difficult to scrap, and stressful. But for those professionals, they are complex, easy to deal with, but empowering. This is why business professionals and employees, they actually don't need to be spoon-fed. And the simplest design is not always the most efficient. This is why our roles are designers is important especially in enterprise products, because we want to tailor the experience to the specific professional usage of our users. And so when we designers try to oversimplify things, we are actually making it harder for them to use our products. So that brings me to my second topic. How do we know when to stop simplifying? Again, the idea is not to go back when everything was a mess in the interface. I'd like to introduce a concept that can help understand how to reach the right balance. It actually comes from a financial theory on portfolio management about risks and returns. And after working many years in complex design, I realized that this can be adapted to us, to design considering people's business expertise and interface expertise. So first, let's define these words. Business expertise. It's a person's knowledge in an area or topic due to their studies, business trainings, or work experience. So for example, when you start a job, you're kind of just trying to understand what's going on. But after a few years, you mostly want to be efficient. You want to stay in the flow. And this includes the mental models of how people approach their tasks and processes at work. I really like this meme from Jordan, who worked on some of our projects. Um, because as you can see, uh, Jordan works with people who love Excel and who really love to ask replicating Excel in the brother. And that's true. Uh, in complex industries, people tend to love Excel a lot. They just assume that every feature should allow them to manipulate data as efficiently as in Excel. And I think they can kind of write when they get frustrated when they cannot. All right, so let's move to interface expertise. It's a person's knowledge on how an interface works due to their training, habits of using it, or maybe experience from using similar apps in the past. So let's say you've used the food delivery apps. Well, roughly, you can know how to use them all. And so now, if we plot the two together, we'll get something like this. Any design above the curve is overcomplicated. You are making it harder for the users to use your service. But any design, any combination below the curve is oversimplified. You are destroying user value and putting them at risk of not being able to do their work. And so the curve in the middle is the UX efficient frontier. It represents the sweet spot. And ideally, you want to be on the curve. For example, at this red mark, this is where most products with a large consumer base are. Therefore, low business expertise, and low interface expertise. Again, think about getting food delivered, listening to music, when you're not working in the industry. At this red mark, I think that's where a lot of legacy tools are. Um, there's a high interface expertise, but for medium business expertise. And because the interface was made for professional users, people thought that it was just OK to throw a bunch of data and inputs in it without really thinking about the hierarchy. I would say that this is actually where my team split one is when we work on redesigning tools and systems. We are trying to get closer to the curve. We're trying to design the best experience, taking into account our business uh, complexity and the user's business complexity. 
final combination, and this one is a tricky one. The interface has been dumped too much. And uh, to me, this is by far the biggest danger for designers who get thrown into complex projects with limited access to users, or who cannot perform user research. Because we have responsibilities on our design. We are impacting real people here. And design issues, they can have real consequences in real life, but in digital products too. People can get mistakes, uh, get hurt, lose their job or worse. So instead of defaulting everything and making things too easy, the question we should be asking ourselves is more, am I giving the right amount of complexity to the right people? Am I keeping enough friction where it needs to be? When my product owners are too influenced by triple or medium, and they're asking for wow effects and sexy designs in the B2B space, well, ask them to think where their product should be on the frontier. And using this, showing this graph, allows them to visualize where they should be. So on the two examples I shared earlier, this is how we map them on the frontier. People with low business expertise well, they can only give, be given the access to a simple interface. But even people with the more advanced uh, expertises, we actually manage different levels of financial expertise in the app. So you can see it's, like more, than a, it's more a range than a point. And in both cases, the backends are the same. But there's a real reason both services exist. We want to make sure that we give the right amount of complexity to the right people. So to, to conclude on this topic, well, depending on the audience, the challenge for us designers is to find a sweet spot between the not too simple and the not too complicated. And we have to take this seriously. This brings me to my last topic today. If you have to design for experts and advanced users, how do you survive? I think a lot could be said here, but I've shortlisted four things that really help the team according to me and they should set you in the right direction, especially if you work with complex environments or have to design with lots of data. My first advice is don't panic. We designers are often prone to the imposter syndrome. And a question we get asked a lot in interviews is, do I need a finance background if I want to design for financial people? Well, no, you don't have to be an expert to design for experts. And I would say experts themselves, they are not experts of everything. I don't think there's a single person who knows everything about finance in this world. But I think we need to acknowledge that it's difficult, not understanding everything is destabilizing. But you'll get through it eventually. I can see on the side that um, in terms of background, educational background, in my team, you can see that there's actually people who studied architecture, foreign languages, fine arts, etc. And I would go as far as to say that you actually don't even need to have a design background to be a designer. Second advice, try non-design tools. Because here we need to make sense of complex elements. We need to identify the mess. And as Abby Covert said in her book, How to Make Sense of Any Mess, there's not many causes for confusing information. It's either too much information, not enough information, not the right information, or a combination of all this. I would put on this and say that actually there are three dimensions. In reality, on a project, there are the users, you, the designer, but also the project members. And the best way we found to deal with this multi-dimensional mess is actually starting with spreadsheets starting with modeling data with real examples in spreadsheets. It's ideal, again, for large amount of data. And doing this ahead allows you to identify when you're confused, but maybe not the others. And maybe also all the different words that people use on a project for the same thing. And they don't sometimes even know it. And that actually happens a lot. It's also a way to act officially. Here's the list of data for our users, and we think that's what they need, that makes the most sense, and that is necessary. It acts as an official record. And you know what? You can actually use a test this list. We do that sometimes on some projects. 
My third advice, uh, my I think favorite one, and I think maybe the most important. So let's say you've stopped panicking, you made sense of the mess, and now um, with relevant tools, and now it's time to uh, design interfaces. You have to be beware of the so-called rules <laughs> that you may be seeing on Twitter or Instagram. The uh, don't do this, do that, or ah, that's the top UX UI tips. Or let's say, oh, if you're designing a form, you have to put everything in one column, show all selections under six options, etc. And I get it. When you see this, which is how our sales and traders talk on the trading floor, you may be tempted to apply those rules to and to put that all this into a single line form. But when you think about it, for example, our developers, they are experts too, and they have a special language too, as this CSS animation, for example. And now, we designers, we are also experts of our design software. Could you imagine, let's say, if someone remade Figma, for example, with all these Instagram rules? Well, actually, I've done it. It looks like this. So I'm uh, kind of waiting for some praise from Dylan and the Figma design team here. I am sure they're loving this unsolicited redesign. But would you use that as a design expert? Not great, right? So don't do that to your expert user. Again, it doesn't mean that everything should, that you see online is bad. And I think the strength of our community is to share knowledge and grow together. But if you look at this example, we are mentioning guidelines, not rules, not tips, not secrets. So rather than talking about definitive rules, it's more important to provide guidelines here. And you really have to be mindful of the context in which they are provided. My last advice today is buddy up. Often, we designers can be a bit full of ourselves. We think we're the hero of our journey, and others, well, they just don't get design and they don't in a way. But when you design and when you have to deal with a lot of complexity, you will not be successful alone. So really, we have to move away from the us versus them mentality to the us versus failure. And changing this mindset can take time. There's no magic rules. We're dealing with humans here. But it's really worth going through this hassle, because ultimately, these people, they will become your champions. And when there's trust, you can start doing really interesting things, and you can start sharing challenges. For example, we've opened our design process to be more inclusive. It doesn't mean that everyone should be prototyping. And I don't think it's the case. But we define together how to best work. And for example, our business analysts will realize that they could help with user research. Before, they were mapping technical flows. Well, they can do it, but with human flows, so with user journeys. And so being able to do it together, or as we like to say, give homeworks to uh, other people on the project, really helps today. Because those people, they actually understand the complexity of the industry and systems, and they can help. To wrap up on my talk today, don't spoon fed the professionals and the employees. You can use the UX efficient frontier to find your project sweet spot and communicate on it. And finally, if you have to deal with complexity, first, don't panic. Try non design tools. Be aware of rules, especially if you've seen them on Instagram, think guidelines, and buddy up. I'd like to close with a final thought. Life is complex, and our tools can be too. And there's really a lot to explore on the frontier. So more than ever, we designers are needed to tame the complexity of life. If you want more stories on complex designs and how to design in the financial space, I'm biased, but you can have a look at my team's Medium blog. We like to share our day-to-day -day life, projects, and side passions. As for me, you can find me on Twitter, Medium and LinkedIn, at Morgan Peng. So it's Morgan with the E at the end because it's the French version. Thank you for joining me today. <laughs>